Um, well, we're all familiar by now, I think, with the fact that uh, meat is a major contributor to carbon uh, in our atmosphere, CO2 emissions. Uh, we're all addicted to it, chicken and pork and beef. Um, and, uh, but what if we just grew it in the lab and reduced those carbon emissions greatly and, and it tasted good and basically we're all still happy. So, to talk about this, Uma Valetti, who's founder and CEO of Upside Foods, is aiming to do just that, to grow all of our meat in the lab and to get consumers to literally take a bite. So please welcome him along with TechCrunch reporter, Christine Hall, who's going to moderate this session. Round of applause, everyone. The lights went off. It's good. <laughs> well, great. Well, so Upside Foods has raised over six hundred million dollars toward the cultivation, toward cultivated meat. And in a recent article, you talked about how what Upside Foods is doing is not easy. In fact, you likened it to putting a man on the moon. So level with us, all of us out here. What's more challenging, scaling or getting people to eat it? Scaling. We have lots of people wanting to eat it right now. We just can't make enough. Yeah, that's, and that's one of the things I wanted to ask, too. Um, you know, there are reports that are suggesting that Upside Foods hasn't been able to make the large-scale quantity meat that you want to. What's the problem there? Well, we are trying to scale to make meat that will go to consumer markets at a price they can afford. Okay. Therefore, what we've done so far with the product that's on the market now is to win with an iconic North Star product that shows the potential of what cultivated meat is. So we picked the hardest thing to do. We okay. said, let's reproduce the taste, the texture, the flavor of a full chicken whole cut breast, a chicken filet. And when people taste that, they're shocked. They're like, this is a flavor explosion in our mouth. Mm -hmm. If you can do this, why would I not sign up? And that, 
that was a beta product. We wanted to get it out. Now, what we're doing in the next generation products is all about scale. Okay. That's what we built an Epic, a manufacturing facility. We opened about a year and a half ago. We've commissioned it, and in the last nine months, we've been continuously making stuff that can go to scale in the next generation products. It can go up to tens of thousands of pounds. And we just announced last week we're going to come to Chicago. We're coming to Midwest. We just announced a $140 million production facility yeah. that can make millions of pounds of meat. Now, this is innovation. It has to go in steps. Right. And so is, is the facility, would you say that that's the problem, or is it people, facilities and or people? Well, this is an industry that hasn't existed 10 years ago. Okay. And that's the reality. So we had to make sure we put it in the context. The idea is transformative. The idea is to say, let's look back 50 years from now, and there is cultivated meat as a choice at every place you get meat. In order to do that, it's not disruption. It's mm -hmm. transformation over years and decades. And so the first step is to show people love the product. That's what we've done so far in getting to first sale. Industry has been seven years old. We went through two of the most toughest regulatory agencies in the world, both the FDA and the USDA, to get a stamp of approval for safety. Okay. The next step is going from first sale to formidable scale. And that is the journey of scalability. It's not easy, but I have more conviction now than I found when I founded the company in mm -hmm. 2015 that our team is going to be able to get us across to that line of showing we can do formidable scale. Okay. Well, will it also take a lot of money? Like, are you going to need to raise more money in order to get the facilities to, to do the large scale production? We're fortunate that we raised 400 million last year and we are still, still sitting on most of it. So we will be able to build the facility in Chicago. Okay. But the idea of doing that is to show, now we are talking industrial scale. Now we are talking okay. about taking products that can start showing the pathway to lower cost and show the box that works. Okay. Now, there is $1.7 trillion of meat that's sold in the world, in which case it's being made in facilities that are hundreds of mil billions of dollars. Therefore, we need a lot of infrastructure. And for this industry to get to scale, it offers opportunity for an enormous ecosystem of suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, and lots of companies. Because we're looking to open the door mm -hmm. and be one of the people that will say, let's transform, come join yeah. us. Yeah. And as pioneers and leaders, that's our responsibility. And okay. there'll be lots more capital that needs to be raised in this industry. OK, great. And I know you said that getting people to try it wasn't a challenge. What has been your strategy in getting consumers to actually want to step up to your plate and put their, your cultivated chicken in their mouth? I mean, the strategy is, let's make sure the product is as good as it can be, not wait for perfection. Okay. Let's get a great product out. Let's get as many people to taste it as quickly as possible. That's the magical moment. People have to taste it. The second magical moment is, having people come and tour where it's made. Okay. It's not made in a lab. It's made in a clean production facility. And when people walk out of our facility at uh, Emeryville or the one in Chicago, what we call as Rubicon, they're going to be inspired. They're not going to be feeling like walking out of a slaughterhouse where they're sl scarred for the rest of their life. Now, that's a magical moment. And the last one is when it's available for them. Yeah. When you mentioned this earlier, you know, walk us through, uh, you know, in terms of like challenges, walk us through what it was like to go through that regulatory approval process. OK, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did not take regulation for granted at all from, day, from the day we founded the company. Mm -hmm. Our employee number six was a regulator who worked at the FDA for six years. OK. The PhD in stem cell biology, cell biology. Mm -hmm. And we're like, it is really important for us to start working with the regulators from day one. So we're not moving fast and breaking things, but building the bridges to say, here is how we're establishing a framework mm -hmm. of how you could grow animal cells with clean nutrients in a clean production facility and make a product that is safe. Mm -hmm. That's going to take years of dialogue. So we've been in dialogue with them for many, many years. Yeah, what, what would you say was kind of the government's biggest hang up with this? Well, I think that what we've learned is we work with both, both sides of the aisle. Yeah. Because when we started the company, it was the Democrats. Majority of the phase of our company, it was the Republicans. And as we got regula regulatory approval, it, it was the Democrats. Okay. We realized that there's a bipartisan appeal to this. Oh, okay. Which is the following. One is innovation and incumbent industry have to coexist 
for America to maintain the leadership for food security in the world. And governments across the aisle recognize that, and they're like, we need innovation like this to stay in the U United States. That was okay. very helpful. The second thing is, both recognize that there are some hot button items related to climate, mm -hmm. and related to animal welfare, and related to the environmental risks of the society we live in. And no matter which side of the aisle you're on, or which extreme you're on, they all felt like it was worth giving a chance to cultivated meat. And it took time to talk to people and say, look, you might hear a lot of things that are misconceptions, mischaracterizations, intentional misrepresentations, mm -hmm. as can happen in anything. Sure. But we're just asking for a chance so we can put a choice on the table, and then you can decide. And that was very helpful on both sides of the aisle. OK. Do you, did, you know, with being able to talk to both sides and then also them you know, wanting to keep this type of technology in the United States, did you have any kind of leverage on that? Or you were just, as you said, really taking this seriously and not trying to you know, mess up anything? I, I wouldn't use the term leverage because we just don't, we have a different worldview. We just reject status quo. We just think status quo is not OK. okay. And when we talk with authenticity backed by a plan that can sustain the rigors of deep diligence and the questions, and that we say, this is our point of view, mm -hmm. and we're willing to learn. No path to a transformative change is going to be a perfectly linear uh, line. And when we recognize that, and people who interact with that recognize that this is a reasonable party to work with, mm -hmm. they're not going to just blindly defend stuff they're doing. If there's a point of learning, they'll learn. I think that was abundantly clear when we started talking about it. Okay. And it's, it'll always be part of the DNA of the company. Yeah. And since you were the first, do you have a concern at all that some of, the, some of your competitors are now you know, riding your coattails on this in terms of, you know, because I, I, I assume that all of this work was expensive. It wasn't free. So you know, are you worried at all that people are coming behind you? I don't think so. I mean, the honest answer is the reason I started this uh, is to get more people into it. Okay. Because transformative change is not going to happen with one company and one team. It's that team that has to inspire that change. Sure. And it was really codified in like the first conversation I had with the venture capitalists who funded us saying that we're going to set the stage, we're going to set the platform. The ecosystem has to really see a massive opportunity here to truly cause change. I didn't give up cardiology to come and do like a niche business. Mm -hmm. I'm here to say, look, this is a really incredibly hard problem to solve. I feel like my life in cardiology and dealing with life and death decisions every single day and bringing people back to life that were declared dead on the field has prepared me for this. And that's abundantly clear because there's challenges. Mm -hmm. But I believe these challenges are not unsurmountable and we're going after it. OK, great. So it's safe to say that you're more optimistic now than you were five years ago about this space? I am, because look at what we've done. In five, seven years ago, this space did not exist. Let's look now. We have 150 companies in the world going after the space in every major meat producing country. We have undergrad and PhD programs in the top food and ag universities that have been started. We have regulatory approval by two of the top regulatory agencies in the world in the United States and in Singapore and other countries doing it. Mm -hmm. And lastly, we have $3 billion of financing that went into it in the absence of any meaningful significant revenue shown. So it tells you that this is a idea that has catch, captured people's imagination. And having a regulatory approval and having products served, mm -hmm. all of this has happened as we predicted. And we are on track to make the change. We may miss a deadline here or there or delayed. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, when we started this industry, COVID did not exist. Half of our lifetime as a company that is innovating with the level of complexity we mm -hmm. have, manufacturing, regulatory, has been during COVID. If we didn't have that, it would have been a different story. But we're still here. OK. And now that you have approval in the United States, are you going to go to other countries now to, to get approval there as well? Here's what we'd like to do. We'd like to, be op we'd like to open up the regulatory frameworks across the world. And we're willing to help any country that wants it or companies in any country. Okay. But we have a laser focus on the United States, because this is where the innovation started. It's an American innovation. Mm -hmm. The first company in the space is an American company that's Upside Foods. And we want to make sure we get into the United States first. And if we have the opportunity to go to other countries or partner with, we will. OK. If, it, if scale wasn't a problem, is, is there any challenges that you see that, that are in, in the way of getting meat where it was, where it needs to be? Um, well, scale and cost are connected. So sure. my 
conviction is as we scale, cost is going to come down. We'll start in the premium, and then we'll go to sub-premium, and we'll go into like mainstream, and then we'll be better than conventional in cost. The other thing is there's a lot of expectations for this to happen all quickly, all at once, mm -hmm. because there is a lot of interest. And I think being patient mm -hmm. is a must-have. Keeping the view of this is not disruption, this is transformation. It's a very massive opportunity, it's a must-have. Mm -hmm. And knowing that the path's not going to be linear, we're going to have like we're going to have some gut punches along the way. Sure. But that's par for the course. And making sure that people who want to have a true experience in this engage with us, we have to learn how to communicate better every single day. And that is the challenge I see, not just costs and scale, because in the company, we are like trying to do a, a number of important things. Sure. And we're always going to be ahead of what we can communicate where we are. There's always going to be a gap. And when we know there's a gap that's relevant, we'll close it as quickly as possible. But just being open to that and saying, look, this is an aspirational target. Mm -hmm. This is where we are. Let's mm -hmm. keep closing the gap. And that's another challenge. Yeah. In terms of cost, it was you know during the pandemic when there was like a meat shortage, the cost of meat, you know, traditional meat went up and almost to cost parity with cultivated meat in, in a way. Um, do you feel like that was a missed opportunity in terms of trying to get more of the cultivated meat out there because it was around the same price or you could get it you know, closer to that price? Well, let me be clear. We had no regulatory approval to actually even go into the market, so the option didn't exist. Sure. Okay. But if in the future there is an opportunity like that, we'd like to get there, but we had to keep in mind, that was a blip, right? It has to be about consistent, sustainable ability to feed people the products they love. Mm -hmm. So the long-term innovation is always there, but maybe this is a quarter-to-quarter -quarter variation. We'll be you know, mm -hmm. on the lookout for things like that. Okay. And you're now in restaurants, right? One restaurant. One restaurant. Um, how, what, would, what did you have to do to, to talk to them about you know, taking a risk on you and, and, and betting on your product? Um, look, a lot of things in life happen intentionally, and a lot of things happen fortuitously. This one was the latter, where we started talking to Dominique Kren, mm -hmm. and it was the pandemic. She's like, hey, I'm really curious about what you're doing. I took meat off my menu, and I want to see what you're doing. And we said, OK, well, we can't take you into the labs because we can't pe get new people, and we'll do an outdoor cookout. We did an outdoor cookout, took a few f chicken breasts, and then once she saw the raw meat, she's like, OK, can I just take over and cook? <laughs> she started cooking on the grill, and she just started like, oh my gosh, this is sizzling. Oh my gosh, it's becoming golden brown like a you know, chicken breast would be. Mm -hmm. And then she sliced it up and said, oh, well, there's chicken fibers. I mean, the muscle fibers, what are these? And then she tasted it, and she said something that we had no idea that existed in the world. She said, this chicken tastes like La Belle Rouge, which apparently is one of the most expensive, oh. tasty chickens in the world okay. out of France. She grew up in France, and she's like, did you know that? I said, no, we don't even know what level Rouge is. <laughs> she's like, OK. Um, she's like, I've been eating chicken in America for the last 20 years. And this flavor does not exist. Our palates have become so bland. There was an explosion in her mind. And she's like, I want to get this in my restaurant. Can I be your first restaurant? That's how it happened. That's great. Well, I'm sure we have a lot of founders out in the audience that are wanting to get into the cultivated meat industry if they haven't already. What kind of advice would you give to them? I'd say it's one of the most meaningful things that you can get into and go after and solve because there's enough problems to solve. We want more people together to work with us. I am very happy to help any founder. I've actually talked to the first 20, 25 founders in cultivated meat companies to think about the common things that will help us all, mm -hmm. educating working with the regulators, and re recognizing that there is going to be challenges along the way, and building this kind of matrix mm -hmm. and connective tissue is a must-have. Let's not put our head in the sand and be in stealth mode. Let's talk about what we have to do. Mm -hmm. So I'd say one of the most meaningful opportunities exists here is this technology, life sciences, and food. And the benefit is an environment, ethics. Like, there's not many opportunities like this. Mm -hmm. And is the technology for cultivated meat, is that pretty much set in stone, or is there opportunity for innovation in, in this area? Look, I, we've been at the cutting edge of this for the last seven years, and we are still seeing enormous amounts of opportunity. There's a lot of unknown opportunities here, mm -hmm. where, like, which direction can we take? Like, the fundamental principles are very sound. We're taking cells that are inside an animal and saying, let's grow it outside an animal because the cell is already programmed to do what it's meant to do. So mm -hmm. it, it gives all the flavors and the textures and the nutrients. And let's find the best quality feed for it. 
Let's grow it in a clean environment, and let's make products out of it. I think the palette of products we can make are going to completely be you know, different in opportunity mm -hmm. and speed than what we can do in the confines of an animal. Okay. And I'm glad you brought up feed because in the plant-based industry, feed is really a high cost. Is that similar to cultivated meat as well? Right now, yes. And it will be for a while. Here's why. Feed is basically a combination of fats, sugars, proteins, vitamins, minerals, mm -hmm. and growth signaling uh, molecules. When you break it down, and we take a very dispassionate approach, we don't need to depend on an animal for many of those things, but much of them used to come from an animal source. We've completely gotten rid of some really difficult animal sources by something called fetal bovine serum. So okay. you had to take it from fetal calves, uh, mm -hmm. and we're like, we don't need that anymore. Okay. We, use a, we used for the first product a little bit of adult serum of an animal, and we don't have to do that for our next generation of products. Now, if we had said, I'll only go to market when I have this whole thing done, no one's going to believe that this is actually going to be worth it. So we're like, let's take a very you know, pragmatic view of how do we get a transformative innovation to the table? Mm -hmm. And the sequence is, you first depend on animals, then you depend on some animal components, mm -hmm. then you don't depend on any animal components, so you completely detach it, except that the animal cell itself is what you need. And we're, we're looking at developing an entire library of animal breeds of cells okay. that can just grow, and you don't have to go back to the animal. And I think some founders in, in this industry don't exactly like the term you know, lab-grown meat, but it sounds like that's kind of where it's going, where it's, you know, you're reducing the, 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 the animal instance and, and are actually doing something in the laboratory. Not in the laboratory. Like, I mean, if, let's say this. If we're going to call what we're doing laboratory meat or laboratory foods, then I think if you walk into a Safeway, 90% of the things that you'll buy in Safeway are actually designed and made in labs in the first time. Mm -hmm. And then they get out into a large, clean manufacturing food facility, which is what we have in California, which is what we'll have in, in, in Illinois and Chicago. Mm -hmm. Therefore, people have to walk through and say, oh, what is this headline telling me? This is, this is not a lab. This is the cleanest production facility I've seen. It is massive. It's you know, 100,000 100, square feet, 200,000 square feet. There is no lab that is doing work in that area. So th it looked like a, a brewery. That's probably the closest analogy. Okay, okay, great. Um, and just a little bit more for, for our founders out there. Um, going back to talking about re the regulatory process, what advice do you have for them to initially go after that? Because I mean, now that, now that there is approval for people, you know, the companies still have to go after it themselves. It's not just a given. So what do you have, advice do you have for them going after that? Well, the regulatory process is something that is real. And, you know, for food, for medicines, you have the most regulated environment that you can think of. Because this is going to have to be passing a much higher bar than maybe something else. Therefore, I think you should be prepared for it. The earliest members on your team should be from some regulatory experience so they understand the language, because a lot of this is language. Mm -hmm. And understanding that it'll take time to build a framework and giving them the time to do it. OK, perfect. And so you know, tell me a little bit about like, your favorite recipe that you've made with your, with your meat thus far. OK, all right. Um, so my mom is in town. My mom is. Um, uh, has never tasted the chicken we made. Okay. And uh, we just did that two weekends ago where I said, you know, I've tasted a lot of recipes, and I love the one that Dominique Cran makes, the, the, the ricotta negro tempura battered fried chicken. That is amazing. And I said, I want to try something that we used to make at home when I was growing up. Every week, we used to go to the market and buy chicken, and we used to bring it back. My mom used to make the the curries, the masalas, and make a curried chicken. And that's what we made two weekends ago, because I've been wanting to do it, but I didn't want to take the meat until my mom was here and ready to cook. She did that, and that, I said that's my favorite, favorite chicken <laughs> recipe. <laughs> well, great. Well, th thanks for that. I, I can't wait to try that at a restaurant. Absolutely. So, well, thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank, yeah, thank you. you.